all this great socializing, but I would like to bring the meeting to order. We have a good shot of having an efficient meeting tonight. So um, it is September 21st, 2016, and I'm officially bringing the Dr. Cog Board of Directors meeting to order. And if we could begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Eva Henry? Here. Bill Holan? Here. Elise Jones? Here. David Beacom? Here. Tim Mock? Chrissy Fanganello? Anthony Graves? Robin Knich? Kevin Flynn? Roger Partridge? Dave Weaver? Gail Watson? Don Rozier? Libby Zabo? Bob Pfeiffer? Here. Bob Roth? Here. Larry Vidham? Here. David Spellman? Aaron Brockett? Here. Ann Justin? Here. Lynn Baca? George Teal, yes. Doris Trular, yes. Ron Angles, Catherine Heider, Laura Crispin, yes. Richard Champion, Here. Rick Teeter, Debbie Nasta, Steve Conklin, Here. Joe Jefferson, Here. Jeff Deacon, Here. Daniel Dick, Here. Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Scott Norquist, Here. Saoirse Karras Graves, Ron Rakowski, Present. Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Here. Shakti, Dana Gutwein, Here. Phil Cernanek, Bruce Beckman, Jackie Malay, Wynn Shaw, Here. John Peck, Here. Ashley Stolzman, Here. Connie Sullivan, Dan Greenberg, Colleen Whitlow, Here. Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Kyle Mullica, Jordan Sowers, John Dyack, Sally Daigle, Gary Howard, Rita Dozal, Here. Anna Metkowski, Eric Montoya, Herb Atchison, Here. Joyce J, Gary Sanford, Deborah Perkins Smith, Here. Bill Van Meter. Here. We do have a quorum. So we have a quorum and we need everybody to stay put because we need 29 votes later on this meeting, okay? So nobody leave early. We're, lock we're, we're going into lockdown, people. So we have a uh, slight change to the agenda. Uh, Sam Light unfortunately had a death in the family and will not be here for the presentation on organizational safety and liability. So we're going to move that to the October meeting. But with that change, I entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? We have an agenda. So um, from my report, um, I can report that the RTC unanimously passed with no discussion the amendments uh, to the 2016-21 TIP that we'll consider tonight, and also the redetermination of air quality conformity for the 2015 cycle 2 2040 RTP, which we will also consider tonight. And we also got a very, very cool briefing uh, from Ashley and Justin on the Collaborative Infrastructure Data Project. It was a lot more interesting than it sounded, but a lot of cool 3D modeling of our region, so hopefully at some point we'll all get to, to see that as well. Um, I need to let you know that um, Jennifer Schaffel is on medical leave for several weeks. She's doing okay, but um, she won't be back this week, but maybe the following week, and uh, we wish her quick healing. And we don't have any more details beyond that, so that's all I can say. Um, the other news is forecasting meetings through the end of the year. It, it was noted that our December board meeting would happen on the 21st of December, and that's not a very good time to have a Dr. Cog board meeting. So we are proposing that that meeting actually occur during the work session time on December 7th from 4 to 6. So if folks could make a, an extra, ec everybody comes to the work session now, so it shouldn't be a problem, but um, we really do want you to make sure and be able to attend that one because ideally that will be the meeting at which we adopt Metro Vision 2040, finally. So 
And we'll figure out when the committee meetings uh, happen on that day if they need to happen. So mark your calendars. And with that, I want to recognize the two committee chairs to see if they have any updates on their committees. So Bob Pfeiffer from Finance and Budget, where are you? I'm way over here, Madam Ooh. Chair. Oh, Ooh. you're hiding. All right. I'm by Inglewood. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted, I, again, thank you, Chair, for um, recognizing. I asked that uh, the two chairs also give a report so you know what's going on in the finance and budget as well as uh, performance and engagement. And other than writing checks, uh, we also reviewed the draft of the budget, which you will see in November. And then also, for those that were in the admin committee, I just want to give an update. It was requested last year when the admin committee was together that uh, we look at an RFP with our state lobbyist, uh, just because it's been some time and that did go out and a recommendation has come back, um, pretty much staying with the same group. And then um, that's all I have. Great. And Director Atchison, there you he go. He left. We just lost count. But I'm here doing this because Bob Pfeiffer wanted more time than I get, so I figured I'd have to do this too. Uh, just from the standpoint of the P&E group, uh, our group just finished up what you are voting on tonight, which is the articles, uh, and it's very important that we had a full quorum here tonight because of the requirement of a supermajority on that. We have a couple of other things we're still working on. One of those will be what's planned to be uh, the presentation on the public safety and liability piece. Uh, we have already uh, determined that we will be taking that up and getting the articles put together and a policy on that. We will start that uh, right after our next meeting, but we want to get this briefing to the board done first. So unfortunately, with Sam not being here tonight, we'll delay that one piece of action, but as P&E knows, we have several others we're working on now. So we will continue to meet. We will not take Christmas off. We will be here. <laughs> Right, Ashley? Hardcore. Okay. Glad you. I'm not on that one. <laughs> okay, so that's all from me and my report, and I'll turn it over to Doug Rex, who is ably filling in for Jennifer. Great. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I do have a number of items today. This is a busy month. Um, before I get to those, I would like to recognize some colleagues that we have in the room this evening from Miami, Miami-Dade MPO. Uh, who are in town um, for a best practices peer exchange. I met with them this afternoon. My understanding is they're meeting with RTD and others tomorrow. Um, they got in on a late flight, and they didn't look any worse for wear earlier today, so we appreciate you coming. When they found out we had a board meeting, they, their eyes lit up, and I was like, they wanted to come. So I said, okay. So, um, so we have um, Eileen, Eileen Boucle, who's, who's the executive director of the Miami-Dade MPO, and we have, I've been practicing this all day, um, Zainab <laughs> Salim, who's the, who's the clerk, clerk to the board uh, and the MPO board administrator. So we welcome you very much. Thank you for coming. We'll try to make it an exciting board meeting just for you. <laughs> Not too exciting. Um, okay, so other items. On, uh, on September uh, 15th, Dr. Cog hosted a small communities hot topics forum. We had 25 in attendance from 13 member jurisdictions and a good mix of elected officials and staff. Um, it was a full day of education and discussion with participation from 15 resource panelists from not only around the state but also around the country who, who volunteered their time to be here. So we were certainly very appreciative of their effort. Um, there is a survey of participants that will be sent, hasn't been sent out yet, has it, Flo? It will be sent out tomorrow to get your general reactions to this, but I believe it was, I've heard nothing but positive feedback. Um, and also within that survey, we, we do request that, you know, if there's other things that we can do as part of Dr. Cog to make, quite frankly, your life better, then uh, we want to hear those going forth. So that was a uh, good success. And thanks, thanks to Flo and the rest of the staff for, for uh, coordinating that effort. Um, Dr. Cog recently hosted a dozen MPOs from around the country to discuss uh, tools associated with scenario planning. Uh, the workshop was supported by the National Association of Regional Councils through funding through FHWA and facilitated by the Lincoln Institute on Land Policy. The MPOs present at the meeting are exploring the formation of a consortium of public agencies, nonprofits, uh, scenario tool developers to improve available tools that will also and hopefully lower the bar uh, for entry uh, into regions that are interested in doing scenario planning. Uh, the results of the workshop were recently discussed at the NARC Executive Directors Conference and uh, uh, the board may hear more about this uh, as the consortium begins to uh, take shape. 
Dr. Cog was also recently uh, participated in a peer exchange hosted by FHWA, four MPOs um, from, from Nevada and the Nevada DOT. The exchange sought to uh, connect Nevada participants to leading practices in integrating transportation and land use planning. Dr. Cog and repre representatives of uh, Virginia were, 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 were invited as uh, experts in the field to, um, to have this discussion with the, with the Nevada folks. Um, Dr. Cog's staff, in particular, Brad Calvert, uh, shared numerous examples of integrated land use and transportation planning for our region, including the Mile High Compact, historic and more recent scenario planning analysis, and efforts to program the region's transportation priorities through the Transportation Improvement Program. And I just say that this, we, we get a lot of invitations to do this type of thing. We obviously can't do them all, um, but I think it speaks highly to uh, the work that you could do around this table and the staff at Dr. Cog. Few announcements of upcoming events that Dr. Cog has sponsored and has uh, reserved, reserved seating. Um, we, have, we, we purchase tables periodically and we do that specifically for, for you all to participate in those events. Um, seating is limited at these events, so if you're interested in any of the three I'm about to mention, please let Connie know as soon as possible. The first is uh, Rocky Mountain City Summit, which is hosted by uh, downtown Denver. Um, it's on o October 6th from 7 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. at the Sheridan Downtown Denver Hotel, RSP to Connie by September 29th. Uh, Metro North Chamber Candidate Forum, uh, October 14th at 7 a.m. at the Denver Westminster, Westminster, I always say Westminster, Westminster uh, Marriott, yeah, I know it. Uh, RSP to Connie, please, for that one by October 7th. And last but not least is a, a Metro Denver, Denver Chamber uh, U.S. Senate candidate forum, and that's October 17th at 11 a.m. in the Sewell Grand uh, Ballroom at the Denver C Center of Performing Arts. And RSP to Connie by uh, October 7th, I have for that one, too. So please, if you're interested in those, get, get your name in uh, as quickly as you can. Um, you have at your place a handout that was provided by CDOT. It's uh, related to HOV3. Um, at the board workshop last month, members um, asked, asked CDOT uh, for some, some more information and internal talking points about the transition from HOV2 plus free to HOV3 plus free on express lanes. Um, Megan Castle is your contact for additional information, and she asked that if members have more want more external facing information for, for, for the public or for your, for your website, please contact her directly. Um, mobility choice. I don't know if anybody's heard this yet or not, but last night at RTD's finance committee, the RTD board voted against funding the mobility choice blueprint initiative. Um, as you recall, Dr. Cog approved funding, at least their share of the funding, for the Mobility Choice Blueprint at the August board meeting. Um, and as the memo suggested last month, the development of the, that Mobility Choice Blueprint was contingent on the funding participation of the other two public entities, uh, being CDOT, which had already committed, and, uh, and RTD. So what does all this mean? Well, we had a conference call this afternoon um, just to talk about you know, what's next. Um, I will tell you that the Chamber still feels very strongly about this project and would like to find a path going forward. Um, the, uh, the Mobility Choice Board is holding a special meeting on Tuesday of next week to talk about just that, whether there is a, a viable path going forward. And uh, um, what we propose, Dr. Cox staff proposes, that once we, we, uh, we will we'll obviously attend that meeting, and if, um, and if we're in agreement, we'll bring a briefing at least back to you all next month and uh, get, get your direction at that time. So it's, uh, it's, you know, it's not quite what we expected, but hey, that's what, there's, this, this, this is where we are. So we'll, uh, we'll see where we can go from here. Yes? What reasons did RTD give for turning this down? Well, I might, I see Bill's getting ready to turn on his mic, so I'm going to let, let Bill Van Meter from RTD explain that further. There were a variety of reasons expressed. Um, the vote was six in favor, nine opposed. It was at, their, at the board's financial administration and audit committee last night. So um, to let you know that. There were a number of different concerns expressed by many of the um, nine no votes. 
including, um, trying to think, the cost of the study, um, given RTD's financial constraints, some board members had concerns regarding committing $500,000 to this when there are other um, priorities, including completion of fast tracks. The composition of the um, mobility choice board, there were concerns about both geographic and other types of diversity or lack thereof, frankly, on the board, um, on the mobility choice board of directors expressed by the RTD board of directors. And also um, worry about how much control RTD and by inference the other public agencies, Dr. Cog and CDOT would have in the process. I thought that issue had been um, well resolved. The three agencies have established a structure for oversight of the consultant um, services and um, uh, staff feel very comfortable about that. But it was the cost, it was um, board diversity, and it was that worry about having the chamber versus public sector control. Those were the three issues that I heard pretty consistently from a number of the folks. There were others, but those were the key themes. Thank you. And that's my report, Madam Chair. All right, thanks. Next, we'll move on to public comment. If there's anyone in the audience who would like to speak to us for three minutes um, on uh, any issues for which a prior public hearing has not been held. Do we have any takers? Don't everyone rush the microphone. All right, seeing no takers, we'll close that and move on to our consent agenda, which includes minutes from the August 17th board meeting. Do I have a motion? I move approval. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We have approved the consent agenda. Now moving on to action items, we have discussion of the amendments to the uh, Dr. Cog Articles of Association and the committee policy guidelines and descriptions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the board will recall that back in March, on, on a recommendation of the Structure and Governance Committee, the Dr. Cog Articles of Association and Committee Guidelines were amended to reflect the uh, formation of our two new committees, the Performance and Engagement Committee and the Finance and Budget Committee, as well as there was specific language added um, related to the Executive Committee and the Nominations Committee. Um, since that time, the Performance and Engagement Committee has continued to refine um, the articles um, and committee guidelines to clarify the duties of its of its newly formed committee. Um, I'm not what I had hadn't intended on going through each one, but I would I would happy to do so if you would like me to. Um, but I will point out a couple notable changes to um, to uh, to the um, um, to the articles as suggested by by the Performance and Engagement Committee. Um, the first is a recommendation that the Dr. Cog Chair also. Is, is, to serve as an ex officio voting member of the P&E committee. Um, and the reason for that is since the committee is responsible for the evaluation and general management of the executive director, um, the committee believed that the board chair should have the ability to be part of those, th th those deliberations. And uh, as such, he or she should be part of the committee. Um, if you notice on the bottom of page 11 of the articles, um, it does note that uh, the board chair will not be counted uh, towards the P&E's quorum. So it's really, it's at the discretion of the, of the board chair whether he or she wants to attend those meetings, but if he or she does attend those meetings, um, she, uh, he or she would have a vote. Um, the other uh, item worth noting, so most of the language is really, you know, associated with that or some additional clarification of duties of the Performance and Engagement Committee. One that had an effect on the Finance and Budget Committee was, um, is that, well, it's a transfer of responsibilities of executing the, con the employment contract with the executive director um, from the budget, or sorry, the finance and budget committee to the, the performance and engagement committee. Um, and it's this, we, we believe, I mean, the, um, the performance and engagement committee, as well as us, our general counsel believes that this was just an oversight when we split the, uh, the administrative committee into two um, this was just something that was just overlooked. But we believe that this, this responsibility should reside with Performance and Engagement Committee 
because, um, because again, they are responsible for the evaluation and the general management or oversight of the executive director. So um, the new language is reflected in the P&E task uh, at the top of page 11. Um, that's where it, the added language is, and it has been removed at the bottom of page 9 under the responsibilities of the uh, Finance and Budget Committee. Um, that's the articles. Now, we, there were also uh, revisions to the committee guidelines, and those primarily, bless you, were just to uh, reflect, the, uh, to replicate the changes that were made in the articles, obviously, so we have consistency between the two documents. There, um, there are also some, um, some cleanup language, I, I, I guess I'll say, that our, our legal counsel has suggested that um, in, in the document, which I think is just general housekeeping stuff. There are two things that staff also suggested, proposed, and the, and, um, the uh, Performance and Engagement Committee was, uh, was, was uh, amenable to that. It has to do with, the, um, with uh, two committees, the RTC Committee, the Regional Transportation Committee, um, removing the references to, Metro, to uh, Metro Vision Issues Committee, or formerly known as, or better known as MVIC. As we all know, MVIC doesn't exist anymore. So the responsibility of selecting um, members and alternates to the RTC will now reside with the board and not MVIC. That was an obvious one. The other, uh, that was on page 13, in case you're following along in your programs. Um, the other was on page 15, has to do with the Technical Advisory Committee, or TAC. Um, and it was simply, it was a, a, uh, to allow CDOT and RTD reps on that committee. It gives them the option of appointing a designee. Um, they, we've had some, if you turn on page 16, it makes reference to, you know, using, using alternates as, as minimally as we can, um, but that was becoming a problem uh, with, with CDOT in particular, so we suggested that we allow them to, to have a designee if they wish to do so, because we, we'd rather have that member designee than, than the alternate. Not saying there's anything wrong with the alternates, but you know, we, we, we wanted to limit it wherever possible. So those are, uh, that's my report on that. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'm sure uh, Director, Director Atchison would also, as the chair of the Performance Engagement Committee, would be willing to take any, any questions. Do we have any questions? Any comments? Deborah. I'd just like to thank you in terms of the committee structure for the TAC, allowing designees, as you know, um, we feel very strongly about participating and sometimes it's difficult to get there, so we appreciate that, the, that you're allowing designees or alternates. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? How about a motion? We have, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Are you comfortable with the margin? <laughs> All right, everybody can leave now. No, just, <laughs> just kidding. All right, well done. So next up we have the um, redetermination of air quality conformity. And this is Jacob. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog staff. So back in March, the Dr. Cog Board approved air quality conformity determinations for the 2015 Cycle 2 Regional 2040 Regional Transportation Plan and Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP. Subsequent to that approval in March, uh, Dr. Cog staff discovered a couple of uh, segment coding errors in our regional travel demand model. <clears throat> we consulted with our, what we call our interagency consultation group, which is our staff working group uh, dealing with air quality and other issues which decided to conduct a redetermination of air quality conformity for the same long-range plan in TIP that you approved in March. In other words, no other changes. Um, this meant rerunning the travel model with the corrected segments, as well as using an updated version of EPA's MOVES emissions model to conduct the air quality uh, conformity analysis. The new pollutant emission results were not significantly different uh, from the previous results that you approved in March. All results were under each of the individual pollutant budgets. What that means is that conformity, air quality conformity, was demonstrated for the Dr. Cog Regional Transportation Plan uh, and for the TIP. 
Uh, there were no comments. We had a we went through a public uh, process, a public comment process, public hearing. There were no comments received during the public hearing, nor during the preceding 30-day uh, public comment period. Uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee and the Regional Transportation Committee have seen this uh, and have recommended approval, uh, and we're asking for a motion from you to do the same. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Jacob? All right, any comments or discussion? If none, then I'd entertain a motion. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. And then moving on, um, discussion of release of the draft Metro Vision Plan for public review and comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just, I think the memo lays this out and we are under attachment E, but just to be clear, this is not a action related to the approval of the plan. It's simply releasing uh, the Metro Vision Plan uh, for public review and comment. Um, as, as all of you know, uh, the board has devoted significant time over the last two years to create the core elements of the draft plan. Um, these elements align with the uh, Dr. Cox strategic planning model, which is provided um, in attachment one. Uh, throughout uh, the course of this year, the board has taken a series of actions to approve kind of the, those core elements um, along the way. And so that public review draft is really uh, building on that strong foundation um, uh, created by the board. Uh, the draft uh, was provided in a link um, in the memo and includes all components previously uh, approved by the board. Uh, but also, as noted in the memo, staff sort of did some massage, massaging and integrated um, some other components um, as well. Um, largely to improve readability and to also try to make this thing something that actually is navigable and understandable to sort of the more um, general audience. Um, most of the stuff that staff added to those core elements uh, were things that were actually um, adapted from a draft plan that was available to both the board and the public um, as early as March of, of 2015. Some examples of some of the other th the things that have been added to the, to the draft plan are uh, there's some maps that we added, some illustrative photos, uh, additional introductory text um, for the entire plan as well as um, each theme, and some transitional text uh, between some of the board approved um, elements. Um, as, as noted, obviously, um, approval will come at a, at a future meeting and just know that the sort of graphic treatments that are associated in the, in the public review draft are very minimal and light. They're just simply to, again, sort of help with um, readability. Um, as noted in the memo, the sort of initial copy edit review that, that, that staff did um, resulted in kind of some minor changes uh, to, to some of the um, elements previously approved um, by the board. Um, and there's a uh, link in the memo that sort of lays out a red, sort of a red line version of an attachment the board saw uh, in July. Uh, we re really feel that those um, changes are not really substantive um, and don't change board intent, but really are focused on creating sort of a, a consistent style throughout the document. Uh, you'll see um, changes such as, you know, trying to use active rather than passive voice, um, changes to ensure correct subject verb agreement, um, spelling things out like RTD so that the, the general reader knows um, what we're referring to. Um, as no, the memo does spell out next steps, um, uh, should the board opt to release uh, the plan this evening. Um, given the importance of this document, we have a, a pretty long um, comment period um, with the hope that we would set a public hearing uh, for the November board meeting, and if all goes well, potentially um, this, this group taking action um, in December. But prior to you taking action, you will receive um, a copy of all comments that are received during that public comment period. And I'm happy to take um, any questions. Any questions for Brad? Doug. I, I might just add, uh, related to uh, Brad said, you know, we did a little bit of wordsmithing on the stuff that you had already approved, I want you to take comfort that we were very careful to make sure that there was no change of intent or anything like that. It was, Brad and I got a real lesson in grammar, I can tell you that from our communications <laughs> folks, believe it or not. Um, and um, it was, it was uh, I'll tell you. Was, I have told many people there is nothing more humbling than a really good copy edit review. That, that just makes true. you wonder how much you actually learned um, throughout your schooling. So. Right. No, I, I just wanted to state that. I, wanted, I hope you have comfort in that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Further discussion on this? If not, I would entertain them. Oh, we have, we have a taker. We have a taker. Forgive me because I, I, I'm new to this, I, and I'm looking at 
attachment E right now. Who, who is this going to, who's going to approve what this is? And what is it for? I mean, I, I don't, I, uh, forgive me for not knowing this, but I don't understand it. Would you please just give me the Cliff Notes version of this? I will try the Cliff Notes version. If it's too Cliff Notey, um, please let me know and we, we can expand. Um, so MetroVision is something that has existed in the region since really kind of the late 90s. Um, this, this board and in, in various incarnations throughout history since even the mid-50s um, created regional plans for the, for the Denver region to sort of lay out sort of shared values, shared expectations, shared notions of how we are going to grow into the future. And so, so, it, th these are our goals? Yes. Yep. Okay. This, this is in many ways is, is the vision of this uh, board for the future of the Denver region. Okay. Uh, and so to your point about kind of how this goes out into the world to get um, comments, so one of the things that if you opt to release this this evening, we will create um, a website uh, to make it available to anyone that wants to review and provide comment. Uh, we will host a public hearing um, in November. We've got about a 50, 55 day public comment period. Uh, we will do a whole series um, of e-blast out to regional stakeholders. There's been this, this plan is four years in the making, and there have been a lot of voices around the table who have contributed uh, to really putting something in front of the board. That the, the board then worked, obviously, to make it uh, your own, so we will certainly reach out to all of those stakeholders to let them know that, this, that, the, that the final draft uh, plan is available. And then, obviously, those, um, anything we receive in terms of comments comes back to you, and then the board would take action on this. So you are uh, the entity that would um, approve uh, this document. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Director Teal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, having been a part of the process, I thought it was pretty good. I think it is the, the right time to release this to the public for review and comment. So, Madam Chairman, move to direct staff to release the draft memo vision, Metro Vision Plan for public review and comment. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. And with that, I will read officially my uh, action for setting the public hearing. The Denver Regional Council of Governments, Dr. Cog, hereby schedules a public hearing to receive comments on the MetroVision plan. The hearing will be held before the Board of Directors at 6.30 p.m. at the Dr. Cog offices on November 16, 2016. For further information, please contact the Executive Office at Dr. Cog at 303-455-1000 or write to Dr. Cog, 1290 Broadway, Suite 100, Denver, Colorado, 80203. All right. So then moving on, we are at the amendments to the 2016-21 TIP. Thank you. So contained in attachment F are amendments for four existing TIP projects, seven new TIP projects, and one adjustment to Table 5 of the 1621 TIP document. So the first project is a new project that would add pre-construction activities along the US 85 corridor from I-76 to 124th Avenue, sponsored by CDOT Region 1. The second amends the existing North Metro Rail Bike and Pet Access project by the City of Thornton. Uh, this amendment proposes to adjust the, adjust the scope to reflect no improvements at the 144th Avenue station, along with other project modifications. The remaining amendments are in reaction to additional TIP funding for waiting list projects. So earlier this year, Dr. Cog was made aware of additional funding through the FAST Act. So this funding, in combined with pre previous project savings and returns, totaled $21,399,000. So at, this, at that time, Dr. Cog's staff began the process of selecting projects from the waiting list of the approved TIP. The first step in that process is to uh, query existing project sponsors and ask them if they'd like to advance their project phases or funding into an earlier year. So after each sponsor was queried, three sponsors requested to advance project phases. Those include projects from Castle Rock, RTD, and Superior. Those are contained in the top of page two. The next step in this process is to select projects from the actual waiting list. The waiting list contains two ranked lists of projects one for SDP Metro and another for CMAC and or TAP funding. The SDP Metro list contains projects 
for uh, roadways and studies, while the CMAC and TAP list contain um, bike ped projects along with transit projects. So for the SDP Metro ranked list of projects, the first two um, sponsors were contacted, Commerce City and Longmont. Each were offered their full funding um, grant as according to the waiting list. Both accepted and agreed. Uh, with the remaining balance of a little over $11 million, Douglas County was contacted to offer a partial amount to the remaining project. Um, after discussion, Douglas County accepted and agreed to complete their original scope with this uh, reduced federal amount. Those three projects funded with STP Metro will be located on the bottom of page two in the memo. So, and finally, there is a CMAC list of ranked projects. Uh, very similar to STP Metro, the first two sponsors were contacted, uh, University of Colorado Boulder and City of Boulder. Both were offered and they both accepted their full funding amount. Um, the remaining amount of a little over $1 million was allocated to Denver. Um, they agreed to partially fund, the, or use the remaining funding, funding to fully complete their project as originally submitted. Those three projects are on the top of page three. And finally, there is an amendment that would be necessary to table five of the TIP document. So if action is taken tonight, um, there was projects that would need to be re removed and those projects remaining would need to be renumbered. Uh, that is contained within attachment three. So I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have, um, but otherwise we would recommend a motion to adopt a resolution approving these attached amendments along with adjustments to table five. Any questions? Director Atchison. Wow, we are speeding along. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All right, all in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? Passes unanimously. What an agreeable group we have tonight. Not even a Bronco night. And, <laughs> all right. We're on to informational briefings, which will be Doug Rex and the board workshop debrief. Great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, as you, as you all are aware, we had our uh, board workshop in Breckenridge on, on August 5th and 6th. Um, we had 27 directors that attended, uh, the, which included 25 members and two alternates, representing 24 jurisdictions. Uh, it was a small but mighty crowd, and we, I think we had a very good discussion. Um, and by all accounts, we, we, have the, we did send out an sur evaluation survey to those that were in attendance, and the results are included in your packet this evening. We'd be happy to, to uh, um, address any questions that you might have related to that. Um, but based on the results, at least what I've seen, I've been uh, delighted by um, the, the positive response we did receive. And we appreciate, of course, you guys filling this out. I know you've got plenty of other things to be doing, but it really helps us in uh, preparing for our workshop next year. With that said, um, I would like to draw your attention to the last bullet within the memo, um, talking about you know when is the best time to host that workshop, because this, of course it's never too early to start planning for next year. Um, there were some some issues, uh, you know, associated with having the meeting um, in early August. Um, some kids are not quite back to school then. And, um, you know, people are taking their last-minute vacations before the kids get back to school and all that kind of good stuff. So um, my question is to you all. Uh, I'd like, quite frankly, if you had any comments about the, the workshop that you, that you would like to share with the group, that would be great. But with regards to the um, when to host this, uh, this uh, uh, workshop next year, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that as well. Is earlier in the summer better? Is a little later? I will say that the Performance Engagement Committee suggested the possibility of having it um, the weekend before the Labor Day weekend, so kind of the last last full non-holiday weekend in August. Um, so that's, I'll just throw that out there as a concept. Director Roth. So just a few comments I wanted to make. Um, first of all, on the one hand, it seems a little bit disappointing that we had 24 out of basically 54 jurisdictions represented and, and there might be some truth to that but I would also point out that on a regular board meeting like tonight we have 30 out of 54 so 24 out of out of 54 might seem um, like not a good attendance and would like it to be much better 
but uh, just wanted to point out that we have 30 here tonight. The other thing is that uh, from a personal standpoint, this was the uh, third workshop that I've attended and I thought that it was uh, by far the most engaging group and the most productive and the most educational. And I attribute part of that to the fact that, um, and I can say this since I'm on the executive board, the executive board and the executive director pretty much set the agenda in the past because we didn't have the performance and engagement group. Now that we have the performance and engagement committee, they were very actively involved in setting the agenda, uh, setting the, uh, the docket and everything, and, and I think that it was uh, much more collaborative and, and had a lot more uh, wide-ranging input, and that's probably one of the things that, that made it more engaging, made it more interesting. So for those of you who, obviously there's always gonna be schedule conflicts, but for those of you who are not able to make it um, by choice, I would encourage you to be there next year because the performance engagement group is, is gonna be actively involved again. And I think that if you've, if you've gone in the past and you felt like maybe it was the same old, same old, or whatever your thought process was, um, this was really a different workshop and it was, it was well worth the time. Director Pfeiffer and then Director Etchison. Uh, yeah, I'd also like to echo uh, Director Roth's statements. I, I do, this is my third one as well, and I think uh, the content was outstanding and I applaud the P&E team and committee for putting that together. Um, but it's also a time for us to get to know each other and collaborate and, and actually have no agenda just other than maybe having a little dinner, breaking some bread, and, and, and building those relationships which, which are critical for us to be successful in the region. So I would also ask that you come next year if you can um, because I think it, it is beneficial at all levels of government. And uh, uh, again, and I also want to say the mm -hmm. content in which the uh, uh, presentations were done were so much better than in the past. And, and I, if you've heard me before, I think our work sh sessions should look like what we saw up there uh, at this retreat. So hopefully we'll see that being introduced in the work sessions moving forward. Again, thank you for those that were involved and put it together in staff. Director Atchison. Well, I don't want to pile on too much, but just to <laughs> think, especially for the first timers who were up there for the very first time, uh, I appreciate very much you came uh, I, on behalf of all of, uh, the executive board members because it was enlightening to hear some new faces there, get some fresh ideas that coming back in. And if one thing about this particular meeting this year, if the chair is going to shame you or try to get you hooked into doing something you really don't want to do, she at least provides Crown Royal to get you to do it. That's what we call leadership, people. <laughs> Director Crispin. Um, as one of the people who did not attend because of prior commitments, um, in our city, village, the fourth most boring town in the United States. Um, um, a l we're just, our council's gone, our com August is just a bad month generally, and then the time that you are suggesting is actually when I have to get one of the kids off to college, but even for our village, it's when we start to do things for the villagers again to keep them bored. And um, so, at least speaking for Cherry Hills, all of August is bad for us. So, or it, it's, it's just a bad time. I can't speak for other people, but you know, going into the first or second week of September, I th after Labor Day, after the Labor Day, the weekend after the Labor Day weekend, everybody's back. All the kids are off to college or wherever they're going, and I just think it it would make it easy, easier, at least for me. <laughs> Director Teal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in association with the timing, of course, um, I think uh, one of the topics that came out of uh, Performance and Engagement Committee was a matter of um, notice. Um, obviously, Performance Engagement Committee were uh, constituted over the summertime, so it was kind of hard for uh, the committee to really push out a date, push out the notice, um, I kind of just kind of got lucky that I uh, I was being bored that weekend actually. So, 
I was even in Cherry Hills Village, actually. So um, one of the things that I would just uh, ask staff to do is please make sure we have, uh, a good, and actually, I guess, uh, not just staff, but the Performance Engagement Committee, let's make sure we do have uh, several months' notice uh, for the board members uh, before next year's. Um, and then the second topic I'd like to speak on, uh, just real quick, is in terms of um, another topic that came up in discussion in the committee was um, the Friday-Saturday uh, timing, having the events on Friday in the afternoon, but then also having the Saturday events. Uh, just being a uh, part-time uh, civil servant here, or elected official, I had to work on Friday. And actually, I missed most of the Friday activities just because uh, you know, I had to make sure the mortgage got paid. Uh, I know there's many of you that are in the similar situation to myself. Um, so I, I think keeping both the Friday afternoon, um, uh, the, the orientation, the mini courses, but then also having the real meat and potatoes on that Saturday, I thought that was extremely beneficial, uh, at least for myself. Other comments? Well, I'll take the opportunity to agree with my colleagues on what a great retreat it was this year. And I've been to a number of them, and I would say this was the best. And um, Bob's probably right that it was the best because the XCOM didn't have anything to do with it. But <laughs> so hats off to P&E for some good planning. But it, w it was good. And the staff really, really um, did a great job on putting together some substantive presentations. So. Any other final comments? All right. Well, and, and we don't have to decide on a date today, oh. but I think you know we you know give give us some thought over the next month, and maybe we'll bring it up next month. But uh, the only issue I'm having, the further we get into September, is um, you know we kind of got this process now that you know we have a discussion about the the budget and strategic initiatives at the workshop, and being able to get that through our committees in a timely fashion. So the second week in September could probably work. Roxy's going to kill me. She's not, she's not in the room. Um, I think it will work, but that will give us a, uh, some opportunities to discuss internally, too. And we'll, we'll report back. We have a few more comments. Director Roth. So I think there have been at least two or three uh, concrete suggestions for dates. I wonder if we can just do a survey among I mean, obviously, with this large of a group, you're never going to get probably even half. But maybe we can do a survey among here or something like that. I think that's a great idea, and I, I, I guess I would add that it m made very logical sense how we had it set up, and it was deliberately set up that the retreat feeds into sort of the strategic planning budget process um, because they used to be at opposite ends of the year, and so the two didn't relate. So I have to say that I, I, I think that really works out well, so I hope that we keep it somewhere in the vicinity of where we did it this time because I, th I think it made sense. Director Henry. And then I'll, I'll put a little stick into that is the fact that when you start going into September, you've got elections. Next year, you're going to have the municipal elections. This year, you have the commissioner elections. And so the closer you get to November, the less likely those people are going to be showing up. So that is definitely something that, that we have to consider. So, you know, I would suggest spring, April, May. Okay, so just to kind of, sorry, but I think September... I, I didn't come in August because I am running for office, so. So uh, I eavesdropped there on that comment. It sounds like P&E will um, continue to work on the timing and, and discuss what works best for most folks. All right. And that takes us to committee reports. And um, I'm going to suggest that... Um, not because we're short on time, but just to make sure that our committee reports are relevant to Dr. Cog. It's okay if your particular committee didn't talk about anything relevant to Dr. Cog. You don't have to report. No pressure. Um, <laughs> so, well, you know, right? Um, so with that said, I will report on the August 26th stack meeting. Um, for those of you who haven't heard, the uh, transportation um, Commission approved funding for the new CDOT headquarters. It's going to be downtown near the football stadium, which will be a great location and help with re, um, uh, rejuvenating that part of town as well. And they used COPS in order to finance it, not transportation funding. 
Um, I think most people have heard about the Volkswagen settlement that's happening because um, of the air quality um, rejiggering they did. Um, it has the potential to send at least $61 million to Colorado and uh, the Colorado Energy Office, CDPHE, CDOT, and the RAC are all working together on a plan for how that money might be spent. And there's some sidebars on what that looks like, but stay tuned. The stack is doing its annual retreat in October. Um, we submitted our nominations for alternative fuel, fuel quarters for the state. There's no funding attached to those designations, but hopefully it may help attract some funding um, in the future. So it's good to have those um, designated. We'll hear back on whether or not those are accepted in December. The stack's continuing to do work on the National Multimodal Freight Network. And then I think um, particularly interesting, CDOT is doing a pilot program on road usage charges, which I is, is charging a user based on how many miles they travel. It's a four-month pilot that they're going to do with 100 um, participants from uh, different geographic areas, urban, rural, to really test out the different um, mileage reporting methods and, and technologies. So it could be an exciting way. As you know, the gas tax is not how we're going to fund transportation in the future, so we're looking for alternative methods. So it's good that we're actually um, looking at these kind of things. Did I get that right, Deborah? So I think those are the highlights from the stack. And with that, Director Atchison, Metro Mayors. Yeah, Metro Mayors, although the caucus did not meet in September, our caucus meeting is in uh, October. The Transportation Committee did wrap up uh, their work that, uh, and this is really reaching out to all of the municipal elected officials here tonight, make sure to get the word to your mayors to be at the October meeting because the Transportation Committee is going to read out the findings of that work that they've been doing there. So it's very important that all of you are there or at least represented so that you can get the findings and get the information from the Metro mayors on the transportation study. That does relate back to Dr. Cog, and CDOT, RTD, everybody that's transportation related. Great. That's all, Madam Chair. All right, and I'll report for uh, Director Rozier. The Metro Area County Commissioners um, haven't met all summer, but we will meet um, in two days uh, to, to do a big um, session on affordable housing. So I'll report back on anything interesting that comes from that. Um, I, I don't, Phil Cernanek is not here. So Jayla, it's back to you. Hi, everyone. Um, we had uh, some program reports in the Aging Advisory Committee. We now have 384 assisted living in the region and 85 nursing homes for a total of 469 facilities in the metropolitan area. We know that 16 are in the pipeline. Uh, so this program is good. the ombudsman, the, the requirements for the ombudsman program just keep on growing and growing and growing. I just hired two new people and I already feel like I'm behind. Um, also, you know I've had concerns about the level of care in assisted living. I think it is the, the most challenging level of care that we have in the region. We had, we had a couple deaths. Um, in the last two months in assisted living. Um, we've had some drug diversion, so staff not giving their medication to residents. Uh, it's, it's the complaints that the ombudsman investigate are pretty intense. We're also seeing a, seeing a huge increase in our call center. So we have a call center where people call in to ask a number of questions. Um, housing is a big one. About 40% of our calls are about affordable housing. Um, how do I get my medication? I can't afford my medication. I can't afford uh, to pay the rent. I can't, you know, so financial assistance and then service assistance. In August we, uh, of last year, 2015, we had 367 calls. This August we had 1,009. Wow. So you can see there's a huge increase. Now, one of our goals in the Area Agency on Aging was to increase, because I don't know if you remember, I was really upset when the 2015 need ass assessment came out and it said people, more people didn't know how to access community services and information. I was really upset about that because we invested so much in it. 
Well, something's working because uh, we're getting a lot of calls. My staff are like, no more, no more. Um, a few months ago, we had a retreat for the Aging Advisory Committee, and one of the things that the Advisory Committee wants to do is get in more, in, more involved in advocacy. And so we had Mickey and Rich come out and talk to them about kind of how the Dr. Cog legislative process works. You know, you all decide what, what bills we're going to um, take positions on, and then we talked about ways that they could help in the advocacy process. Uh, and then uh, they made a recommendation, and Rich and Mickey are going to do Advocacy 101 here in the next couple of months. So uh, they'll know how to make a call to a legislator, or they'll know how to go talk to a legislator if they, if they want to. So that was interesting. Shannon, our lead ombudsman, Shannon Gimbel, has now been made the chair of a committee that is rewriting the assisted living re uh, regulations for the state of Colorado. So that's very exciting for us, stressful for her, because uh, there's a lot of different interests. And then the funding um, subcommittee decided that they're going to put out the RFP for our funding um, in November. So it's coming out a full month earlier uh, so that we can go through the Dr. Cog process and not be rushing everything. Uh, in the end, uh, we'll have about $15 million that we'll be granting out to local service providers. And our radio program, No Copay Radio, which you've probably heard about, 1430 AM, is the number one rated program on Saturdays uh, for seniors. So yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jill. I, um, I asked the chairman, the chair, Madam Chair, if I could just uh, comment real quick. Um, since Jennifer's been out, I've been privy to some emails and voicemails that, Jen that Jayla has shared with me about uh, some basically thank yous from clients regard in the aging division. Now, I'm telling you, this aging division, they're rock stars. It is unbelievable how much pride that I have for the work that they're doing back there. And they, they, they never complain about anything, <laughs> but they do tremendous work. And I, it's just, you know, I, I just hadn't had an opportunity I mean, I knew they were doing good work. <laughs> Hearing those messages and, and emails, they, uh, you guys do some great work. Thank you. Thanks. Yay. Oh, Director One Pfeiffer. more. Jayla, so we went ahead and posted all of your posters all over the city. Yay. Uh, to help promote your radio show. So maybe <laughs> it helped. I don't know. But yeah, every I've... kiosk and every uh, public <laughs> building. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's all coming from Arvada. We do have the largest... Senior population. Well, see, and county, I thought my so. mom and my stepdad live in Arvada. I thought it was them, but well, it's how to you. do it for you because of that? You know, there's a relationship. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Jada. Shakti is not here. Are do any of the other RAC members present want to report? Mr. Atchison. Yeah, just on the RAC, the we have wrapped up the recommendation that has gone to the Regional Air Quality Board. Uh, so that's out for review for them. There were some initial comments that came back that still have to be addressed by the RAC committee, but we're still waiting for them to get to finish up on the public comment review period. Great. Director Rakowski. Uh, the first half of the month, our uh, E-470 meeting was canceled because of the convention that was hosted for uh, the Trade Association for All, Toll Roads and Bridges. All right. Thank you. And then last but not least, Bill Van Meter. And Bill, can I ask you to report on sort of the funding issues um, at RTD? That I think a lot of folks in this room will be interested in, in what action the committee took on that. Certainly. And that was my only item on, the, on my update. So thanks for that lead in. Last night at the same committee meeting that the board, um, as we talked about earlier, did not approve forwarding in a committee format, but did not approve um, funding for the Mobility Choice Blueprint. They also had another action before them, and that was an action on the year 2016 annual program evaluation and financial plan for Fast Tracks. We call the annual program evaluation the APE. 
Um, yeah, and we've been doing that this since 2007 on an annual basis. Okay. Um, bottom line, and I will go into more details and, and give you a good update, but bottom line is the cost of the committed project through 2019, all the currently committed projects within the Fast Tracks program has not really changed. It's $5.6 billion. Our financial situation has not substantially changed except that our sales and use tax forecasts, our primary revenue source for the program, are a little bit lower in the near to midterm. So that's put some additional stresses on an already stressed financial plan and program for fast tracks. So in our presentation, um, last night to the board, which was a follow-up presentation to a presentation that was made um, uh, the first Tuesday of this month, whatever date that was. Uh, I, our, our, um, we gave our board the annual program evaluation and financial plan. The board on a 7 to 5 vote, yes, there are 15 members and 15 did vote on the mobility choice. This item came later on the agenda, and a, a few of the board members were not in, a, in attendance at this meeting, at, this, at that point in this meeting. So in a 7-5 to five affirmative vote, they approved sending to our full board next week the financial plan and annual program evaluation that I'm about to delve into a little more detail on. So that's all background history leading up to what that looks like, including the continued tight cash flow for us. So I mentioned our annual revenues are decreasing in the short to midterm. That's actually through 20, each year through 2025. That's based on our sales and use tax forecast that the CU LEAD School of Business prepares for us, an independent third party. Um, our total revenues remain below last year's forecast until 2034 because we don't make up the deficit until nine years later than that 2025 time frame. And our total revenues between 2035 and 2040 are actually higher than they were last year. So from now through 2034, lower. 2035 through 2040, higher based on CU Leeds's forecasts. Our debt coverage remains tight. We have no opportunities to issue additional debt for fast tracks until the year 2023 at the very earliest. Of particular interest to our board members and stakeholders is the FISA and the status of the fast tracks internal savings account or FISA, which was established in FISA or FISA. We can't agree on what to call that. Um, which was established by board policy and direction in 2012. The, the FISA was established, quote, um, and all funding through that process will be, or a number of items were identified to help fund the FISA. And all funding identified through those measures and that process would be added to this FISA until enough funding was accumulated. This is board, board direction to staff when the FISA was established in 2012. Um, until funding was accumulated to complete and operate additional projects, the priorities identified were completion of the US 36 bus rapid transit project accomplished, construction of North Metro to at least 72nd, we're beyond 72nd to 124th. And then any remaining funds um, would be left at board discretion on how to be used and could potentially be used to leverage potential grants or private sector contributions. That was the board direction in 2012. What the board committee, sending to the full board tomorrow night, said regarding the FISA um, in a 7 to 5 vote was that um, they approved RTD staff's recommendation to draw down the FISA to cover fast tracks, operations and maintenance costs. Those drawdowns would begin in the current financial plan in 2021. 
until the FISA balance is depleted in 2024. Then for about the next six years, 2024 through 2030, we actually need to use base system revenues for about six years. That's non-fast tracks RTD revenues to help cover projected committed fast tracks operating and maintenance costs for that six year period through 2030. Beyond that time, fast tracks can cover its own operating costs according to these projections. I want to make sure I try to get these numbers right. And um, the recommendation was that when those fast tracks balances start accumulating in 2031, those balances in excess of $5 million get transferred back to the FISA to restore the FISA. So in summary, our financial plan is in balance as approved by the board. There's no net increase in the fast tracks capital costs. However, there are extremely limited opportunities for any additional near-term completion of corridors unless additional revenue sources are identified. Long-term, um, the revenue balances do grow positive again. That's the recommendation that went to the, that the board forwarded from committee to the full board consideration next week. Uh, my attempt, at least, at not being too long, boring, or throwing too many numbers around, but this is something that's um, received a lot of attention from stakeholders, many in this room, as well as our board of directors. So I wanted to take that time and appreciate that opportunity, Chair. Director Brockett. Thank you, Director Grandmeter. Appreciate the update. So is the upshot of that then, uh, do we still have the funding necessary to complete the projects that are underway currently? We do. We have the, um, for both the capital and via the means and mechanisms I just described, drawing down the FISA account as well as um, some transfers of money over a six-year period from our base system operations to cover fast tracks operations to both complete them and to operate them. But then, thank you, but then um, the, the other information that we we're getting is that there would be no money for additional capital construction for a very long time. Um, yeah, the, the 2030 time frame base well, 2030. Start to accumulate. Start money. to accumulate and then um, our Tabor authorization is not very high at the moment, so likely if we wanted to accelerate anything at that time frame based on revenues, this is speculation, okay, um, caveat, um, it, it would likely require either another Tabor vote, otherwise we would have to accumulate enough revenues to do pay as you go. Thank you. Um, so during the six years where you're actually using base funding Presumably that means that somewhere in the system buses will not be running? No, our, um, our forecast held base system services harmless. Our expectation and our um, modeling uh, basically shows that we will have to tighten our belt and do less capital pro capital projects and state of good repair projects, but we can maintain base system services. Okay. No. Nope. Director Mullica. Thank you, Madam Chair. What's the uh, dollar amount that's going to be drawn down? From the base system? No, uh, from, from the FISA. From the FISA. I... I'm not our CFO, so I've got charts here. I'll see if I can find that. So the year end, this isn't a direct answer, but here's the numbers I can readily arrive at. Yeah, our projected year end FISA balance in the year 2020 is $76.5 million. It get, that $76.5 million then gets drawn down to zero in that, um, that time frame, yeah, that, that I described earlier, um, which actually is four, four or five, 2021 through 2024. 
if the non-CFO is reading his chart right. Other questions? Thanks for that detailed report. Obviously, particularly from up north, we care very deeply about what's happening both with fast tracks, uh, unfinished fast tracks projects and base funding. Um, so, Understood. Shared concern. That is the end of our committee reports. So um, why don't we just move to other matters? I know Director Roth had something. Yes, thank you very much. So I received an email today from the people who are running the uh, campaign for Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, and they asked me to share this this evening. Uh, Dr. Cog directors are invited to attend the SCFD campaign event, urging voters to support the renewal of S SCFD on their ballots. Details below. Mayor Hancock has confirmed to attend, as are many other elected officials. It's the Vote Yes on SCFD event, October 4th at 1230 at their headquarters, which is 1175 Osage Street, Denver, 80204. Uh, there will be a short rally with their mascot popsicle and VIPs from around the seven county district it would be great if you could all attend so again real quick October 4th 1230 p.m. 1175 Osage director Rakowski and I might add that that's only two blocks from the Buckhorn Exchange <laughs> which one can reach by almost crawling from the 10th and Osage RTD stop. So what I propose to do is bring from the south a f bunch of elected officials on the RTD line and I would suggest that the folks from the north do the same thing and we all meet at 10th and Osage. At the block, right? at the block. Provided Mayor Hancock and do we have a Denver representative here? We do not so. Well since he's here let's go ahead and commit him to buying lunch. Hear ye, hear ye. All right, any other announcements or matters from board members? All right, we are adjourned at 742.